for being with us today um, uh, again in one of the IEO seminars of the IEO seminar series. Uh -huh. Today we are going to talk about capital flows, particular, um, dealing with volatile capital flows and what countries need in their toolkits. And we have a splendid quartet of uh, contributors and speakers. Uh, let me start introducing them. We have uh, Jonathan Ostry, who is currently Deputy Director of the Asian Pacific Department at the IMF and was Deputy Director of the Research Department for a number of years before that. He was instrumental in leading the work program that culminated in the adoption of the institutional view, which we'll discuss today. So we are very glad, of course, to have his participation in today's event. And we look forward to hearing his views on how well the implementation of the IV, that is the institutional view, has worked out. We also have Anton Karnick, who is Associate Professor at the University of Virginia with a wonderful background from Austria. Uh, he has conducted some of the innovative analytic work that prompted new thinking among the economics profession on the use of capital controls and he actually did contribute a wonderful background paper on the topic to our IEO report so he's very much uh, has um, was in the kitchen uh, for our uh, report we then have uh, Mark Sobel who is uh, US chairman of the uh, official monetary and financial institutions forum following a distinguished uh, four decades career at the US Treasury including a couple of stints at the IMF's executive board. Mm -hmm. He was someone that we turned to early and often as we were preparing our IO report, because he played uh, you know, a key role in the um, working of the IV at the fund. And, uh, and then finally, we have Luke Everett, who's a consultant to the IO, after retiring from the IMF as assistant director in uh, MCM, and before that in APD and other departments. He also produced an excellent background uh, paper, actually two papers for us on the IMF's engagement with uh, Korea and capital flow issues and on the use of capital flows and capital controls uh, by some countries to keep housing affordable. And I think I'll just quickly move to uh, our first speaker, who's Jonathan. And uh, e each of you has uh, 12 to 15 minutes. Please keep your time um, and let's get started. Jonathan, uh, the virtual floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Nicoletta. Let me uh, try and uh, share. Good. Can you uh, can you all see it? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Let me just make sure. Good. Okay. So, um, uh, really appreciate uh, being able to join uh, uh, this group, and uh, thanks uh, to Prakash for making that uh, possible. Um, I, uh, I am going to limit, um, my remarks to a focus on the past and not the future, uh, both in these opening slides and in the discussion. So, uh, those are, those are my rules and obviously, uh, these are my own, uh, opinions and, uh, shouldn't be attributed to the fund or anyone else. Um, I'm going to draw on, uh, since I'm looking uh, at the same issue that, that um, preoccupied me a couple years ago when I gave a lecture uh, at Stanford at the Hoover Institution uh, called uh, Managing Capital Flows Toward a Policymaker's uh, Vatimekum. I'm going to draw on that and the, my discussant's remark, my discussant was uh, John Taylor. Uh, why did I uh, decide um, uh, to draw on this today? Well, actually, I had forgotten about uh, about this, but uh, George Schultz's passing two weeks ago um, reminded me that uh, he was actually the um, moderator of this session. Uh, he passed away at the age of uh, 100 years, and he's... Um, uh, just a giant uh, on uh, the U.S. stage. I think he's the only person in, in U.S. history to have had uh, uh, four different cabinet level uh, positions, um, including uh, Secretary of State and Secretary of the Treasury. So uh, he was a giant. He was uh, actually quite hostile to um, everything I'm about to say, as was 
uh, John Taylor, as was the entire auditorium at Hoover. Uh, so much so that I think when I when I uh, gave uh, a version of this uh, before, uh, John Cochran said, why on earth did I put myself in this position? So here we go. Um, I am going to uh, talk a little bit about the, the analytic foundations of the IV. Uh, and as uh, Nicoletta um, uh, mentioned, I'll, I'll talk about, you know, what I saw as far as some implementation issues, and I'm going to have uh, one uh, one slide uh, at the end on some some questions. Okay, so uh, old issue: boom bust cycles and capital flows. Um, uh, but notice that. Um, how we see these cycles has has really uh, you know changed uh, a lot over the years has has itself sort of gone through cycles. There's this uh, famous quote uh, from the Genoa Mo Monetary Conference in the 20s: "Futile and mischievous was how they characterized capital flows." Uh, then the Bretton Woods architecture, where uh, controls were uh, integral to the to the architecture. Um, and then I think a, an interesting uh, period for for the IMF is the 1990s, um, where we were pushing for jurisdiction and for open capital accounts. Even though uh, those things, you know, obviously are not what what the articles and the founding fathers uh, envisaged, and we would have had to uh, change the articles. Um, and and we did this, I would say. You know, uh, there are others in this room who will know better, but I, I feel it was just it was um, it was not based on uh, on sort of uh, where the profession was or where uh, you know some deep analysis of the IMF. It was just something um, uh, that we that we uh, that we felt at the time, and the only reason we didn't succeed, the only reason I think is was the Asian financial crisis. Uh, and then there was um, uh, the IV in the 2000s. Um, so, you know, my starting point on all this stuff is uh, is the articles, um, which we should remind ourselves um, uh, give countries uh, broad latitude to use uh, controls um, for the regulation of of capital movements. Um, but it's it's not it's not. You know, without um, any restriction, and there's a very important restriction. I think it is is really the only the restriction, which is that um, you can't use controls uh, to perpetuate a significant undervaluation or to make it worse. Um, and uh, so there's this there's this restriction on on using this instrument to gain unfair competitive advantage. Um, so when uh, when the managing director of the time um, uh, in 2010 um, asked uh, for a rethink, our starting point, um, uh, and here I'm, I'm going to draw on a staff position note and a staff uh, discussion note from 2010 and 2011 that were then published in the IMF Economic Review and the JIE a year later, respectively. Our starting point was that um, if you want to manage capital flow volatility, it is uh, logical not to foreclose the use of any policy tool. So all tools that could potentially help uh, should be uh, open to use. Um, and the advice should be guided by uh, the best analytics uh, we, we have. Um, and there is this restriction uh, from the articles about not perpetuating or amplifying, aggravating undervaluation. So those were those were how we how we uh, saw it, uh, and that was the point essentially made in the first uh, uh, staff position note. Uh, and the second, which was dealing more with financial stability, uh, it made a number of points, but one of them I think is is worth uh, recalling, which is that. Um, Oftentimes, uh, uh, you know, macro prudential measures, which which I think we all love, um, uh, are economically quite similar 
to discriminatory measures. Uh, and if you think of, say, higher reserve requirements on banks' uh, FX liabilities, um, they, they do affect materially capital flows. Um, uh, and so uh, they are either, um, you know, a, a hybrid uh, uh, prudential and capital flow measure or a capital flow measure, uh, depending on how you look at it. But they operate uh, very much like uh, uh, macro prudential uh, measures. So, um, so there's, you know, if you think that there is uh, stigma with one kind of label, um, and you do want to safeguard uh, financial stability, then the label is probably not a good idea. And then the second point, of course, is that there may be very good reason uh, for discriminating against non non residents if your goal is to safeguard stability. If those flows are particularly. Uh, if the flightiness of those flows are 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 you know particularly salient from a from a stability uh, a standpoint, so implementation. Um, I mean the things that I uh, that I remember, and I think uh, uh, everyone uh, virtually will will remember, is uh, how contentious uh, the the board uh, meeting was, and how uh, how. Uh, you know, split um, uh, uh, the board was on these issues, and and really that uh, the IV was a, a, a it was a compromise, um, uh, and it was a compromise in in many different ways. You you had you know, we often think of the IV as legitimizing some tools um, uh, that, um, previously had, uh, had been frowned upon by the institution. And I do think, uh, that is by and large the right, the right way of, uh, looking at the IV, but there was certainly uh, a view in the board that, um, uh, these tools didn't need legitimizing because they were always, uh, permitted, uh, under the articles. So by, by, you know, uh, giving circumstances, delineating circumstances under which these tools could be used, we were actually, uh, uh, you know, hampering uh, the uh, the ability of emerging markets to 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 use these tools rather than uh, destigmatizing uh, uh, the use of those tools. Anyway, um, the IEO uh, in its uh, assessment. Uh, viewed uh you know the iv as a step uh, as a step forward um and i think um you know uh the sense from from their uh from their report is that country officials on the whole um uh were ha have been supportive uh of the iv as a as a step forward uh for the for the institution um you know one of the things that that has happened uh, in the intervening decade is that uh, the IV is a document, um, and you know um, it 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 had to be interpreted. I don't know if it really had to be interpreted in the way it was interpreted, but it it was interpreted, and um, you know there's kind of case law that that came down in the years uh, that followed it. Um, and, you know, to my thinking, uh, it wasn't always the most, uh, the most helpful, uh, uh, interpretation, mo most helpful, um, uh, case law. I, I think it, you know, my 1st point is that, um, really, uh, we, we tended to lose sight of what I had in the very opening slide, which is that, um, uh, the centrality of, uh, of, uh, of the principle that you not use, um, uh, these kinds of instruments um, to gain unfair competitive advantage, but uh, if if that is not an issue uh, uh, when you want to use these instruments, um, then really the IMF should not have all that much to say. Um, there's this issue of uh, whether uh, CFMs uh, can be uh, uh, applied uh, in in so-called non-surge periods, and what is a surge? And that that gave rise to a whole bunch of case law that I think, uh, by and large, was was not helpful. Um, there's the the issue of you know uh, putting labels on particular measures 
whether they are um, whether they are MPMs or CFM MPMs or CFMs, um, and you know I think this has uh, stigmatized uh, the use of some uh, of some prudential measures in in a less than helpful way. Um, I think you know there is um, a missed opportunity to tie in uh, this whole area of fund surveillance with another area, which is our, our uh, external sector report and, and our, where we pronounce on, on whether uh, uh, countries uh, are, are pursuing policies or have misaligned uh, currencies, in particular undervalued uh, currencies. And then there's the last issue, which frankly, we, we did not uh, have in our, in our mindset uh, when the IV was uh, uh, being worked on, which is, um, you know, the fact that capital controls um, uh, and, and capital flows uh, can give rise to uh, complicated and, and very important social and distributional issues. Uh, and again, um, you know, how, how are countries going to contend with those and, um, you know, what, if any, uh, role does the IMF have in assessing uh, use of, of uh, these instruments to contend with social and distributional issues? Um, so, you know, I, I, you know, there's some examples here, um, you know, uh, my own country, Canada, uh, used, uh, so, some, inst some of these instruments to, to deal with housing prices for, for social objectives. Um, and, you know, uh, I, I think, you know, the fund assessed these as, as problematic. Um, uh, but again, uh, you know, it, it didn't seem to me that there was a, a, a close tie in. Uh, uh, in this particular case with, with the foundational principle that I talked about, uh, at the, at the beginning, um, you know, again, the, the labeling is, is really important. It's, it's important because we don't want to discourage countries from, uh, uh, taking steps to safeguard financial stability and, uh, labeling, uh, labeling measures in a certain way can do just that. Uh, 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 apart from which, of course, um, there may be good reasons uh, to discriminate, as I said uh, uh, at the outset. Um, you know, one of the, 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 the pre-IV part of the orthodoxy was that um, fiscal policy is a very uh, important tool for, uh, for dealing with surges. Um, and it's, um, you know, base, the basic advice, uh, you know, where we started from when, when we wrote uh, a book on, on this issue with, with uh, Rex Ghosh and, and Mavash Qureshi was really that, you know, the baseline advice was, uh, you know, let the currency float and um, you, you tighten fiscal to avoid overheating. But in fact, um, uh, fiscal is, is, is rarely used. It is certainly not. Uh, the first port of call for countries for managing capital flow volatility, and I think there's good reasons for that. So, you know, uh, it just, you know, it, it, it sort of makes you think whether um, uh, indeed the, the sort of baseline advice before the IV uh, was not uh, right for, for a rethink. Um, uh, flexible exchange rates, again, the, the, the second part of the pre-IV orthodoxy, um, again, we know, uh, we, I think we knew at the time, and we certainly know now, uh, that, uh, that flexible exchange rates can give rise to amplification rather than moderation, um, uh, when countries have, uh, unhedged balance sheets. Um, and so again, this, this gives rise to, uh, a, a, a welfare based, uh, uh, motivation for using uh, a number of the tools, uh, envisaged, uh, in the IV. Um, uh, distribution on social issues again, uh, uh, these strike me as 1st order important, uh, for countries, um, and weren't envisaged as being something that needed to be contended with in the IV. Um, and, uh, you know, to my thinking, uh, since there isn't a close tie in, uh, between, uh, these kinds of issues and the articles, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I think, uh, maybe laissez faire is, is the right answer here. Um, and then my final slide, um, you know, uh, I, I mentioned the delicate political balance uh, question I would have is how does that balance look today? Um, and then, you know, really internalizing uh, uh, what we uh, have learned, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the sort of primary importance of the key stipulation in the article in the article strikes me as, 
as uh, central, uh, um, uh, not venturing, uh, uh, you know, into peripheral peripheral areas. Are, are, are there lessons to be learned? Um, uh, you know, are there are there lessons from the implementation? Is there something we we might do differently? Uh, and then, you know, if we are going to, um, uh, as the IV intends, uh, use these tools, um, uh, you know, in the future, as we as we have been, um, we want to make sure that, you know, the kinds of frictions that make these tools appropriate aren't perpetuated uh, into the indefinite future. So we need uh, to uh, encourage countries uh, to also pursue policies that increase market liquidity, financial inclusion, and reduce the frictions uh, so that the payoffs from open financial uh, markets and the cost benefit analysis from open financial markets uh, can be improved. I'll stop here and uh, stop sharing. Thanks, Jonathan. That was very insightful. Great uh, uh, rear view from uh, your rear mirror, and uh, but also some food for thought. And I think we're very much on the same page. Uh, some of the things you said and what the evaluation found about refreshing and keeping this document uh, alive. Uh, I will give the floor now to Anton. Anton Arnick. We can see it. We can't hear you. You're muted. Sorry. Okay. Uh, good. Can you see the presentation view or the slides? Yes, we can hear you. We can see it. Great. So, let me take it away then. Um, so, I will very much build on the comments that Jonathan has made and let me thank uh, the IEO for putting together uh, this workshop today on the heels of a very interesting and comprehensive evaluation of the funds framework on capital flows. So, um, what I want to cover today is I want to first speak a little bit about the theoretical developments that underlay both the, EV, the IV and the developments in capital flow management since. Then I will speak a little bit about the implementation of these theoretical developments and how they relate to the IV and to the later IMF frameworks, such as the integrated policy framework that's now under work. And then I will make a few broader remarks on the role of welfare objectives in economic policy analysis and how that relates to capital flow management and finally international spillovers. So to start with the theoretical developments, uh, in some ways one can say that this perspective that we want to manage capital flows, that we don't just want to let the free market arrange everything, is based on the notion that there are externalities to capital flows. So, generally speaking, when financial markets are imperfect, prices do not necessarily reflect the correct social benefits and costs of capital flows, and that implies that the decisions of private agents are, are generically going to be inefficient and that there is a scope for intervention. So, uh, that was at a very high level, but more tangibly, what are these imperfections and what are the consequences of these externalities of capital flows? So, there are two big categories uh, that the academic literature focuses on. The first one is financial amplification effects. That's something that we are all very familiar with from financial crisis. Those are basically the feedback loops, the doom loops that lead, for example, in emerging economies to declining exchange rates, balance sheet effects, deteriorating financial conditions, which further depreciate exchange rates, and the doom loop goes on. Very similar phenomena are playing out in asset markets where Asset prices declines, 
the decline that deteriorates the net worth of financial intermediaries uh, that makes them cut back on lending leads to further asset price declines. And again, we have one of these feedback loops. Now, whenever such feedback loops happen, and they always do during financial crisis, they give rise to pecuniary externalities. So intuitively speaking, an individual market participant doesn't take into account that when they take on risk, when they take on leverage, for example, when they borrow from abroad, that they will contribute to the severity of these uh, financial amplification effects, to the severity of deleveraging, and therefore the severity of exchange rate depreciations or asset price declines. Those are the pecuniary externalities. A second phenomenon are, uh, that is related to externalities are aggregate demand imbalances that lead to demand externalities. So what does that mean applied to the context of emerging economies? Well, intuitively speaking, if you borrow more during good times, then you're more pushed against the wall during bad times. And that means you really have to cut back on aggregate demand. And if policymakers don't have the tools uh, to restore demand to its efficient level, for example, because uh, they have to uh, weigh a trade-off between exchange rate objectives and demand stabilization, or because they face zero lower bound on interest rates, then it implies that uh, any other policy measure that can restore demand or reduce the decline in demand during crisis will be desirable. So in particular, if we engage in capital flow policy that's counter cyclical, that leans a little bit against the inflows during good times and against the outflows during bad times, it means that we will also smooth the purchasing uh, power, the basically spending capacity of uh, emerging market actors, and that will contribute to optimal demand management. So whenever these externalities exist, and we could go through further ones, but those, are, those two are the main ones that the literature focuses on, then there is a role for intervention. And in particular, there is also a need to differentiate policy by the residence status of who is engaged in financial transactions. So economic theory tells us that we need something like capital controls, something that discriminates uh, between economic agents based on their residency. Now, one thing that I want to emphasize is that, so when Jonathan was describing uh, the push for liberalization in the late 1990s, that was kind of a time when uh, the academic community uh, felt that, uh, you know, the work inside of the IMF is not necessarily quite aligned with um, the debate on capital flows in academia. But uh, what I really want to highlight over the past uh, decade or two, there has been a large number of contributions by the IMF to this debate. And if I look, for example, at cutting edge work, like what has been done uh, in the context of the integrated policy framework, I would say the IMF is back at the cutting edge of academic research on these issues. So that's really something uh, that I was very happy to see. Now, um, when we have these externalities, there are, of course, different types of interventions that we can engage in. The first ones, and in some ways the most direct ones, when we face misaligned benefits and costs of capital flows, would be price or quantity limits on precisely those capital flows. So those would be capital controls. A second set of policy instruments, and in the real world, we see that much more is foreign exchange intervention. Now, um, but I want to point out those two face different costs and benefits. And what is really interesting is that in theory models, the pure capital controls, 
uh, that uh, you can describe in models as, for example, taxes or quantity limits on inflows or outflows are actually always preferable to foreign exchange interventions because foreign exchange interventions rely in addition on some sort of market segmentation between domestic and foreign uh, FX markets. And that means that you need to basically account for additional imperfections in the economy to make foreign exchange intervention desirable. Otherwise, there's some sort of um, Ricardian equivalence result going on and uh, foreign exchange intervention is basically not the desirable instrument. So the puzzle in some ways is that in theory, capital controls are kind of the first measure to go to and foreign exchange intervention would be further down the list in practice, I have the sense that it's oftentimes the opposite. So let me now speak a little bit uh, about the policy frameworks on the management on capital flows. So I think it cannot be overstated what a sea change the institutional view represented. And I think it was really an enormously positive step forward. But uh, as Jonathan has already uh, voiced in some ways, it was a little too restrictive on capital controls compared to what the theoretical literature would suggest. For example, it was too restrictive on the prudential use of controls on the preconditions uh, necessary for uh, when controls would be advocated and on the temporary nature of controls. There was also a bit of a bias towards macro prudential measures that are not capital controls. Now, in some ways, the integrated policy framework that is now underway has uh, really taken that analysis one step further. And as I said, it is based on a very impressive body of work. It has a nuanced perspective on the desirability of uh, capital controls, or I guess uh, I should use the uh, correct IMF language, capital flow management measures versus foreign exchange intervention. And then one step uh, in particular uh, that I found very welcome is that it takes better account of the differences in countries' objective circumstances. So it delineates conditions, for example, when uh, foreign exchange intervention may be more desirable, when capital controls may be more desirable based on the objective circumstances that we see in a given country. Now, I want to say a little bit more about the role of welfare objectives. So first, let me point out uh, that uh, these latest papers in the integrated policy framework, they actually are solidly based on welfare objectives from which all the results are derived. And that's really the starting point in any modern economic policy analysis. Uh, so we always want to start by clearly stating what are our welfare objectives and then essentially maximizing them and seeing where that will lead us. Now, um, one challenge in policy making is that economic policy uh, usually always involves trade-offs. And I should say these trade-offs, uh, they're always existing in the real world, sometimes in very simplified frameworks, for example, the targets and instruments approach by Tinbergen that has been very influential uh, behind, for example, the Mandel Fleming framework. Those trade offs are not there because uh, there is the assumption that you have enough instruments to meet all of our goals. Well, in the real world, we never have enough instruments to meet our goals. And that means uh, there always are trade offs. And these trade offs are particularly stark for policy measures that are inherently second best such as, for example, capital control policy. Uh, now, why do I say second best? Because capital control policy uh, is something that always derives from certain market imperfections. And when we have these market imperfections, for example, as I discussed, uh, these financial amplification effects or demand management issues, and we cannot directly uh, fix the underlying problems, which in the real world we never can do, then second best policies like capital controls can oftentimes contribute to improving the situation 
and going part of the way towards uh, improving our welfare and meeting our welfare objectives. Now, as I said, for an exchange intervention uh, in our theory models uh, is third best in the sense that uh, it relies on additional frictions in the market uh, for foreign exchange. And that means this, the trade-offs are even starker. Now, um, what I really want to point out and what I think is really important for international institutions like the IMF is that different member states generally have different preferences. And I think that's something that's desirable. Uh, we live in a pluralistic world in which different countries uh, weigh things differently, in which different countries have different views, and that's what makes our world so rich. But what that implies is that a one-size-fits-all welfare objective cannot quite take into account that richness of preferences. And what it does in the extreme, if we push policy based on the notion that everybody has the same preferences, everybody has the same utility function, everybody weighs trade-offs in the same way, it risks a backlash against technocracy. So what do I have in mind when I speak about the welfare objectives that we need to consider for capital flow policy? Well, uh, the first one would be volatility, because we know that capital flows can contribute to a great deal of volatility. They can also uh, interfere with growth, especially when they lead to financial crisis. Uh, issues that have received attention uh, only more recently are the effects of capital flows on income distribution, on financial development, and so on and so forth. So, for example, Jonathan's example, uh, of uh, capital controls to stem against uh, house price increases in certain areas of Canada. That would be a very clear example of where uh, income distribution objectives would enter uh, the debate when we talk about capital flow management measures. So, uh, in my view, the role for a new IV, for an updated version of the IV, uh, would be to spell out the menu of efficient policy options while letting member states choose their own welfare objectives. We should not impose a one-size-fits-all objective function on all countries, uh, but I think it makes a lot of sense and it would be a great contribution uh, to the political and policy debate to define and really analyze spell out uh, what the different policy options are that we would take if we want to place more weight, for example, on income distribution, or if we want to place more weight on growth, more weight on volatility, and so on. But yeah, for, for that, we really need further refinements in our analysis, further refinements that take into account all these novel policy objectives that member countries are struggling with. Now, let me say one last word on international spillovers. So, whenever we speak of capital flow management, uh, the question of spillovers naturally comes up because capital flows obviously always involve at least two countries. So, let me first observe that spillovers are simply general equilibrium effects. They are natural and necessary for the functioning of the international monetary system and they're not a club to push countries to avoid any policies with spillovers. So, uh, generally speaking, almost any policy uh, that an open economy can engage in is going to have some spillovers. That doesn't mean that it shouldn't engage in that policy. And just because a policy measure entails spillovers doesn't uh, create a case against that measure. However, there is a role for cooperation in three very specific circumstances. The first one is one that Jonathan already emphasized is encapsulated in the Articles of Agreement, which is strategic behavior, terms of trade manipulation, or uh, as Jonathan referred to it, exchange rate undervaluation, which is the most common form that this takes. A second form uh, of imperfections 
that calls out for cooperation is when countries face incomplete or imperfect policy instruments. And then a third one is when there are imperfections in international markets themselves. So, for example, when we experience a global crisis and there are global liquidity problems. So, what I view as the role for the potential role for the IMF in this context is to clarify those specific circumstances when there is a role for cooperation and also uh, establish when there is not and to provide more operational frameworks for when cooperation can contribute to improve global welfare. Thank you, Nicoletta. Thanks, Anton. Uh, clear as always and i encourage everybody uh who uh learned something from this to read anton's uh background paper because there's much more in there to be uh, to be gained and it's a truly uh a unique contribution to the debate and now i'll pass the floor to mark mark sobo would like to hear your views on uh what jonathan and anton said and you, you discussed with you the valuation um and you, of course, have a, a very good perspective on this all. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. I thank the IEO for inviting me today. It's an honor to be here with uh, friends and colleagues virtually and on a panel with world renowned economists, uh, especially because I hardly fit in. But um, the IEO recently finished a first rate evaluation of the fund's 2012 institutional view on capital flows, the IV. And it concluded that the IV's intellectual analysis had become dated and run up against implementation difficulties, and it called for a refresh. Um, so I think the IEO is right that the distinctions between macro prudential policies and capital flow measures, CFMs, can be blurred. Uh, more research on capital flows and policy responses is clearly warranted. Um, a decade ago, as Jonathan said, the G20 and the IMF heatedly debated the role of CFMs and endorsed the IV. It was a tenuous compromise. The IV recognized that CFMs may be appropriate for a country experiencing major inflows uh, with sound fundamentals, a fairly valued currency, and adequate reserves. Uh, it underscored that uh, CFMs should not substitute for warranted macroeconomic adjustment. Um, I think that the IEO's work, uh, the IV, um, should be considered in a broader framing, which some, uh, which has already been alluded to, and that is um, the integrated policy framework. So the IPF focuses on optimizing the combination of monetary policy, macroprudential policy, foreign exchange intervention, and capital flow measures based on. EM emerging market country specific costs and benefits. It's predicated on the notion uh, that the Mundell Fleming impossible trinity um, can detrimentally push countries towards exchange rate flexibility in the presence of dominant currency pricing and capital market imperfections. And it argues that dominant currency pricing slows export responses associated with flexible rates. Uh, causing larger than warranted currency swings. This is the amplification effect that Anton was uh, referencing. Um, and, and just to add, Helene Ray's work on the dilemma is another contextual feature. She argues that a global financial cycle has transformed the trilemma into a dilemma and that independent monetary policies are possible only if the capital account is managed directly or indirectly. So I think all this work merits great praise. It advances thinking on exchange rate policies and capital flow volatility. Um, uh, perhaps it's uh, all not as new as it seems. The role of exchange rate crashes causing major national balance sheet problems was a central feature of the Asia crisis. That experience spawned the development of work on developing local currency bond markets to counter the original sin of uh, foreign currency borrowing, you know, let's be clear, local currency bond market development isn't a panacea. Foreign investors can crowd into such markets and then run like lemmings over the cliff. Um, that exports and imports didn't respond to currency fluctuations as one might have thought was recognized decades ago in discussions about J-curve effects. Um, economists have long 
advocated gradual sequenced approaches to capital account liberalization, especially when financial systems were weak and markets uh, illiquid and shallow. Policymakers accepted a judicious role for CFMs long ago. There was much praise for Chile's and Cahe, for example. Uh, since Jonathan mentioned uh, his Stanford experience, I'll say Treasury at the political level was late to this party, um, given our undersecretary at the time. Uh, Treasury staff was more aligned with uh, Jonathan, the view. Um, foreign exchange intervention has actively been used by emerging markets, even after the majors uh, move squarely to floating. And the international community has long accepted a role for intervention in countering disorderly market conditions. So while the new contextualization offers insightful analysis and has shifted the academic landscape, caution and humility is needed in my view in its translation into policy conclusions, especially as I reflect back on my experiences as a policy official. So it's welcome that the IV recognizes the benefits of capital flows. Um, as Jonathan and I know, frankly, in the run-up to uh, the IV, uh, this, this point was fought over quite a bit. Um, flexible exchange rates are not a panacea. They can amplify, as Jonathan and Anton um, said. If one wants exchange rate stability, no matter the regime, one has to run sound policies. Flexible rates don't change that reality. Um, in my view, in many cases, most cases, they're still better than the alternatives. Um, and since Jonathan mentioned Stanford and George Schultz, you know, um, the obituaries I saw about him were all about his role in the State Department and the Cold War. But um, the world moved to floating uh, exchange rates when jo George Schultz was Secretary of the Treasury and he was known to have pushed uh, in that direction. But anyway, back to my script. Um, warts and all, flexible exchange rates can help ease and distribute the adjustment process between domestic and external adjustment. The European crisis showed us that internal devaluation doesn't work well at all. Uh, the IPF itself observes that for EMs with rather liquid financial markets and decent fundamentals, exchange rate flexibility should bear the burden of adjustment. Um, for me, the academic discussion and a lot of what we see from investment analysts um, in their discussion about capital flow volatil volatility seems overly generalized. So one's often is presented with charts showing big swings in EM capital flows, um, and there's a bit of an innocent bystander narrative that goes along with it. And I think one needs to dig into the data. Um, so, you know, is China in or out? Because China can swamp everybody. Uh, does the capital flow data include FDI? Or is it only portfolio flows? BOP data often references other capital flows, but these can be larger than portfolios and flows and may not be as well understood. There's the difference between capital inflow and outflow cases. Um, does the data account for idiosyncratic causes for volatility? For example, one might have different views about what drives capital flow volatility when looking at treasure, uh, Turkey, Ukraine, and Argentina rather than Indonesia. Capital flows may reflect improved fundamentals, the so-called pull factor, pulled capital. Economists often talk about a global financial cycle. Now, th this is frequently code for Fed monetary policy in large measure. Now, uh, we remember the absurd Brazilian allegations about the Fed and currency wars. Undoubtedly, Fed monetary policy impacts global capital flows. There's no denying that fact. Um, there is push capital. I think the extent of that merits further explanation, ex, uh, exploration by uh, academicians. Jay Powell in a 2018 speech argued, some observers have argued that U.S. monetary policy influences capital flows through its effects on global risk sentiment, with looser policy leading to more positive sentiment in markets and tighter policy depressing sentiment. While those channels may well operate, research at both the Fed and the IMF suggests that actions by major central banks account for only a relatively small fraction of global financial volatility and capital flow movements. 
As a U.S. official, a former U.S. official, uh, I argue that countries shouldn't adopt CFMs or intervene and engage in excessive reserve accumulation to sustain undervalued currencies. Further, macro policies and currency adjustment should be the first line of defense rather than CFMs. Now, uh, in the world I dealt with at the time, uh, I once sat through an IMFC meeting where a high-level Asian central bank official openly objected to communique language that CFFs, CFMs should not substitute for warranted macro adjustment. Other EM officials argued that CFMs should be adopted as they saw fit regardless of macro adjustment. Excess reserve accumulation is an ongoing feature of the international monetary system, especially in Asia. It's happening in droves right now, and it can unfairly absorb demand from others and generate protectionism. Um, so to answer one of the questions posed by uh, the IEM for today's discussion, to me, and I think Jonathan alluded to this as well, the external sector report is an outstanding document. It's a huge analytic upgrade. But what the research department and country mission chiefs can do, do can be two different things. And I've always noticed that the fund can formulate very complex judgments about fiscal and monetary policy. But when it comes to exchange rates, which is the fund's raison d'etre and a sensitive topic for members, the fund often muffles its voices, especially in Article 4 it's about surplus countries and currency undervaluation. So, uh, and I'm not trying to sound like an American. I think the U.S. needs to show far more humility about its exchange rate views and not throw stones and glass bottles. Um, regarding the search for the optimal mix between monetary policy, macroprudential policy, exchange intervention, and capital flow measures based on an EM situation, I'd offer a cautious uh, a caution about over-engineering. EM policymakers might not really have the knowledge and foresight to strike optimality between so many competing forces. Even the IMF might not have the capacity to know what is optimal today, let alone tomorrow. A temporary CFM might become permanent and distortive when vested interests develop. CFMs may not be effective amid leaky capital. So uh, let me wrap up uh, with two questions. First, even if one stipulates for argument's sakes that the IPF, the dilemma, and the IV refresh were spot on, could they collectively create a permissive intellectual framing that might be used in policy circles to downplay distortions associated with the use of CFMs and undermine exchange rate flexibility. Second, as for the refresh, perhaps there is limited editing that is feasible, but is there also a risk that doing so could open up the entire IV and major contentiousness? I'll stop here, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, very stimulating, and uh, the debate goes on. I think uh, I want to pass the mic to Luke, so he can uh, tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, his contributions to the valuation, and also talk about social objectives. Luke. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Nicoletta. Um, I'm trying to share uh, a few slides, which I hope. Uh, works um so thanks for uh, having me on on the on the webinar um it's uh, uh difficult to uh, follow in the footsteps of uh, three distinguished uh, speakers who i think have uh, covered uh, uh you know many uh, if not all the uh, issues and so um i thought that uh, what i could do perhaps was just um, respond uh, to by uh, illustration to a couple of the points that were made and that um, may cause some difficulties in sort of revising and setting up uh, a new framework that as mark uh, uh, called it uh, doesn't become uh, too permissive a framework to allow um, sort of uh, misalignments and other uh, 
you know, macro policies that we, we do not uh, uh, see as being optimal. Um, Jonathan mentioned uh, already the uh, examples of the Asian countries, um, um, Korea and uh, uh, was one of them. And he also mentioned uh, uh, housing measures in Canada. And I'm going to use uh, the work that was done in the background studies to illustrate a couple of points. I think um, it's um, um, already uh, quite quite uh, obvious to everybody that um, um, Korea and other Asian economies basically address capital flow volatility with sort of the usual standard framework of, of measures, you know, sound macro policies, then some uh, foreign exchange intervention, and um, uh, last uh, but not least, uh, some, some currency-based uh, macro uh, prudential measures. Now, um, I would point out, uh, and this is with reference to Anton's framework, that uh, these uh, currency-based macro prudential measures that were taken uh, by uh, Korean and other uh, Asian economies um, were not residency-based measures. They were uh, basically currency-based measures. And I think that brings out uh, an interesting issue, which I'll get to in, in a minute. Um, of course, uh, <clears throat> the fund argued that, uh, as people mentioned before, uh, foreign exchange market intervention should be done only for disorderly market conditions. And the fund supported these uh, currency-based macro prudential measures um, because uh, it was seen um, as a response to uh, surges in capital inflows and you know, a good way to dampen um, uh, you know, the negative consequences of capital flow volatility. But uh, um, as some people have already noted that uh, you know, the authorities, especially in Asian countries, viewed matters a little bit differently, especially on uh, exchange rate uh, intervention, where they basically said, well, we agree in principle that this should only be done when conditions are disorderly, but maybe our interpretation of disorderly conditions is a little bit broader than what most people have in mind. And you know, one of the things that comes up uh, often is that these uh, the authorities are worried about what they call speculative ex expectations of secular exchange rate uh, appreciation, uh, which you know, seems to be uh, underlying a lot of the developments uh, in Asia. And the other point that uh, Mark uh, made is that um, they uh, really see a need for some somewhat high levels of foreign exchange and therefore feel that foreign exchange intervention you know, is a tool that also uh, allows them to build up uh, what they think is an adequate safety net. Now, we all know the background and uh, the historic trauma of the Asian crisis, so we can understand a little bit where they're coming from. Um, and then obviously uh, there is a, a question uh, that was raised by uh, uh, people when they felt that international safety nets uh, were not adequate to deal with the capital flow volatility and the sudden stops that they were uh, facing. Um, and this, this I think, is, is an important uh, aspect uh, that causes some difficulty for the uh, updated policy framework. I'll get to that in a second. Um, but first, uh, the authorities obviously uh, felt that uh, their uh, currency-based macro prudential measures ought to be permanent uh, elements of their toolkit. And uh, not just uh, in response to actual capital inflow surges, but also uh, in a preemptive manner as a, uh, you know, in a way to prevent the emergence of such flows to begin with. Now, going to the point of um, the emphasis I, I put at the beginning of this presentation about the fact that the macro prudential measures that were taken by countries were really measures that were not based on residency, but they were based on currency. And um, you can uh, see uh, that uh, Korea here, if you look at the domestic banks um, in Korea, Korea had managed uh, very much to uh, eliminate the sort of currency mismatch, which underlay a lot of the problems of the Asia crisis and, you know, goes to the point that uh, Anton make about uh, 
amplification effects of uh, of currency mismatches well but they, they basically dealt dealt with that quite quite well um of course they were not so much concerned about the foreign branches uh currency mismatches because they had parent companies which presumably had a balance sheet that contained sufficient foreign currency to uh, support those banks but uh, what happened uh, in the context of uh, korea is that um there turned out to be uh, maturity mismatches building up and you can see that on the right hand chart maturity mismatches meaning that uh, uh, foreign banks were basically providing um, short-term foreign exchange to uh, a number of agents in Korea, um, particularly the export sector, because the export sector, as you know, uh, contains uh, shipbuilding and other durable goods. They, they have very long gestation contracts and they wanted to hedge against uh, this uh, idea of the secular appreciation of the currency. And so they wanted to borrow for an exchange or engage in swap instruments that led to the same thing. And um, at the end of the day, this led to high vulnerability to rollover, as we all have seen in the global financial crisis. So when the sudden stop came um, around 2009, um, in, in that 2007-2009, uh, that the, the uh, Korean authorities faced this problem again, and they were unable to provide foreign exchange liquidity because obviously they couldn't print uh, dollars and had to run to the Fed to uh, get a swap line to get them out of difficulties, which in the end worked out, but they didn't want to have a repeat of this. And as a result of that, they put in place um, these currency-based uh, constraints that uh, forced uh, um, agents not to have this maturity mismatch on foreign exchange um, liabilities. So, um, so what is here two, I think, important points? Well, first of all, many advanced economies did the same thing after the global financial crisis, but they did it in their own currency because there was no transactions taking place in non-reserve currencies on their territory, so nobody worried about the capital flow implications of that. Obviously, there was there was no issue. Um, but in the case of Korea, you know, they had no no tools to provide foreign exchange liquidity, and thus put these controls in uh, themselves. But I think where the question becomes complicated, and it's a point that um, I believe Mark alluded to, and and others as well, uh, and Jonathan, is that. Um, so what drives the expectation of the secular exchange rate appreciation? Because at the end of the day, this is what underlies the behavior of the Korean export companies. They wanted to have very long-term hedges because they all anticipated uh, what the, uh, you know, that there could be this uh, appreciation. And so the question I think that we really have to uh, ask ourselves is, uh, you know, is it due to a stance of monetary of macroeconomic policies that drives the exchange rate away from uh, what we could call its fundamental value, however difficult that is to 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 guess what that is. Um, so I think if if the new IPF framework is is going to have to face this issue because if the framework ends up supporting these uh, currency based uh, macro prudential measures, but there are expectations of secular changes in the exchange rate. Well, the IMF may face a situation where uh, it's perceived to sort of uh, condone these measures uh, to delay or avoid, um, you know, warranted macro adjustment. So I think this is one area where things uh, are a little bit tricky and that will definitely need to be addressed. Now, the other um, element that uh, Jonathan mentioned and other speakers as well is uh, the the aspects of uh, distributional uh, nature and the objectives that were not envisaged when the original institutional view framework was uh, put in place. Um, obviously, the fund traditionally looked at housing mostly from a perspective of financial stability and with good reason, given past experience, uh, obviously, we, we 
we uh, all remember tulip mania in the Netherlands and, and other housing crises. But uh, I think uh, recently in advanced economies, affordability has become an issue. And you can see there uh, how in some uh, countries, uh, the price to income ratios uh, has, has changed uh, dramatically, how uh, you know, the median um, uh, multiple of housing in some uh, cases is very high. You know, if you look at Hong Kong, uh, it, it's hard to see how anybody can afford uh, a house there. And in some other cases, uh, like Canada, Australia, and some other advanced economies, the issue is much more localized. Uh, it's not a, a countrywide issue, but a um, sort of a limited city issue. So um, it, the fund uh, went at, uh, and analyzed uh, the measures that were taken by, uh, in this case here, five advanced economies, and in all cases ended up saying that all these measures to deal with capital flows into the housing sector are all capital flow management measures. This was almost automatic because uh, measures discriminated on a residency basis. So, um, you know, that was uh, you know, considered by definition to be a capital flow measure. But as you can see, the application led to very different, uh, different results. Um, in two cases, Hong Kong and Singapore, uh, the fund uh, agreed with the authorities that the measures were also macroprudential in nature and uh, they addressed systemic financial risk. So um, here, um, you know, they, they supported uh, these measures. Um, but we, we were left with the debate uh, that is still open that whether these measures could be put in place on a permanent and preemptive manner, which was definitely uh, what the authorities wanted to do. Um, in other cases, the measures were not seen as macroprudential measures, which um, was um, sort of um, straightforward because, uh, for example, in the case of uh, Australia, um, the measures were taken by regional authorities, had nothing to do, uh, they, they didn't have any control over macro policies, so, so basically, uh, or macro prudential policies, so, so basically that's uh, how they were diagnosed not to be macro prudential and in the case of Australia, not to be a substitute for macro prudential policy, macro economic policies, and therefore the fund supported the application in the context of Australia. However, it didn't do so in the cases of Canada and New Zealand uh, because the staff argued there is no link with uh, financial stability and there is no obvious link with uh, capital inflow surge. So um, the bottom line of the experience in the housing sector is I think the integrated policy framework should see uh, to what extent um, other objectives other than macroeconomic and financial stability uh, are important. And uh, um, basically um, also, I think uh, to a point that Jonathan made, look at the macro relevance of these measures, because in, in many cases, uh, there was no sort of significant uh, impact on capital flows. I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luke. Thanks so much. Um, I think we had a more, uh, you know, great um, inputs, and I would like to take some questions. We have uh, certainly we can start with the one by Hector Hector Torres. You want to um, ask it yourself, Hector? I think he's not here anymore. Not here anymore. I think it's it's uh, we, we can ask it anyway. Oh, oh, yeah, sorry, I see him. Hey, yeah. yeah. sorry. And actually, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I was going to ask you anyway, but go ahead. Go well, ahead. My, uh, I know we're speaking about um, capital flows of any kind, uh, including, of course, short term capital flows. Um, but uh, coming from a developing country, well, I was at the IMF uh, during uh, several discussions on the um, the view of the institutional view. And, uh, you know, many emerging markets and developing countries are very concerned about uh, ensuring they need capital flows. But on the other hand, they uh, have very shallow financial markets. They can be, you know, they could be as 
economy coming in and coming out. Of course, coming in is always nice. We feel rich. The exchange rate appreciates. We travel around the world. The real estate goes through the roof. But when it goes out, it's a disaster. So uh, we need capital flows. On the other hand, uh, um, uh, rich countries, capital ex countries that have exceeding capital, including those that create uh, monetary easing or use monetary easing and create uh, um, international reserve uh, um, assets, um, are mostly countries that are, have aging populations, including China, of course. And so they face a situation in which they have a fiscal problems, seriously, with pensions, mostly. And either they export capital or they have to import migrants. And migration is a big problem in the world. One of the most important challenges that we have to face in the next years. So there's a trade-off, I believe, and this is the question I would like to put to the panel, if there's a trade-off, uh, between uh, capital flows and migration flows. Uh, if there is, uh, there could be a win-win trade-off between ensuring stable job-creating capital flows into young countries to uh, reduce migration flow pressures into aging countries. Naturally, of course, uh, I, I don't ignore that uh, you cannot get capital flows, job creation, job creating capital flows, particularly into countries without uh, good business opportunities and sound macro policies. Now, the point is, uh, is there a chance for the IMF and the World Bank to promote a win-win deal between stable capital flows, promoting stable capital flows, and uh, uh, on the other hand, in order to discipline and reduce migration flows, which is putting at stake democracy in many uh, mature markets. That's my question. I uh, open the floor. Maybe I want to say something myself. I mean, the the contributions today were mostly about capital flow management in the shorter run, and of course, the IV has these two elements. One is the you know management of flows in the shorter run and their volatility, and one is the liberalization which is a more medium to long-term aspect of capital flows. And I think your question perhaps goes a little bit more to the medium-term uh, concept of, of capital flow uh, management. The, uh, yes, I agree. I agree. It's, it's, it's not about short-term capital flows, and it's not precisely about CFMs. Yes. Uh, but but uh, before I pass it to, to them, I just may add that when Jonathan was in rest and I was in rest, we did a very nice chapter on uh, the impact of demographic change, which goes a little bit at your question on aging and this flows for younger economies and you know, the international consumption smooth. And I think if it's a 2005 contribution, if I'm right about the year, and, and it does go at this mix of you know migration and capital movement as uh, opposite ends but uh anton jonathan mark and luke if you um would like to say something to actors questions um yeah I'm, I'm happy uh to start uh i'll have uh thoughts only on one aspect of hector's point so hector this is a really interesting observation and Probably the connections are understudied, so I was happy to hear about Nicoletta and Jonathan's paper. Um, I think the positive thing is that we know what types of capital flows uh, countries can receive with minimal risks. So if we encourage flows to occur in the form of FDI, especially greenfield FDI, then we know that the risks are much, much lower. And uh, I think the kind of bargain that you are suggesting could work out very well. So, yeah, all these externalities, all these negative effects of capital flows, they really depend on what exact type of flow. And I think one of the big challenges in implementing any kind of capital flow policy, including the one that you are suggesting, is to develop uh, really uh, solid workable frameworks that countries can uh, employ that minimize evasion and that steer flows into a direction 
that enable risk sharing and minimize risks. Anybody else, Jonathan? I, I can. I haven't thought deeply about this, but um, but just to add what on Anton. So there's the composition of flows, and uh, of course, what what Anton said is is right. Um, but uh, there's also the distributional effects of flows. Now, um, uh, so uh, for a given composition, um, we also know that um, that. Uh, Liberalizing flows tends to uh, uh, not be um, sort of distributionally um, uh, symmetric. So it it uh, it benefits uh, labor versus capital. It benefits the poor versus the rich uh, differentially. So um, it's probably that may be. That may be in part due to the composition. So the distribution, the composition may be uh, related, but um, the idea that uh, if you simply uh, throw a lot of greenfield investment at a country, um, uh, that um, the the poor will um, will uh, benefit equally or to a, a large extent, and so won't migrate. Uh, I, I think that's a, something that has to be checked out uh, in the data. So I, I'm not I'm not sure how easy it is to do your your bargain to um, uh, uh, sort of uh, stop migration by encouraging uh, capital and or as Anton say, good capital. Um, it's, there's there's it's complicated, I guess. Um, so I uh, a, sorry, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to basically agree with where I think Anton and uh, Jonathan were heading. I mean, academics have long suggested that capital should flow to emerging markets, and that's not what we've seen. Um, but, and then there's obviously the issue that uh, capital flow is going to um, tend towards those places where there are good returns and good frameworks. Uh, Anton mentioned FDI being the kind of flow that is desired, but that, that's a private sector uh, transaction, uh, which the government can't control. And then, as Jonathan said, you know, who benefits and will that stop migration? Now, is there a role for more official assistance and support? Um, I think that's a separate question, but uh, I, I think basically Jonathan and Anton uh, had it right. I agree with them and I would say hello to Hector as well. <laughs> I just wanted to add a very small point uh, directly related to the housing sector. Well, it seems to me that some of the flows that we have seen into housing in places like Hong Kong and Singapore and Canada and others actually have to do with the environment of the country from where those countries from, from where those flows stem. So, so there is a question about, you know, what Hector mentions about, you know, you know, if people do not have vehicles for their savings or they feel unsafe uh, what they can do with their capital, then you that leads to uh, you know, capital flows going from those countries. And uh, one of the issues that uh, was mentioned uh, in the, I think in the IEO evaluation is, uh, although maybe only in a narrow sense, is that we, the IV hasn't looked much at source country policies. Although, you know, it might need to look at these policies, especially if we are allowing uh, more uh, capital flow management measures uh, as a you know, normal course of, of action. Thanks. Uh, we have a few minutes and uh, I, uh, I don't see any questions in the chat. I have a question myself, which is about. Um, COVID-19 and the, uh, you know, the big reversal of flows that we saw last year, March, April. Uh, that kind of was reined in uh, by the summer. And uh, there was great fear at the moment because the, uh, the, uh, the flight of capital from non-resident portfolio investors was huge, it was manifold what we saw uh, you know, during the global financial crisis, at least in terms of time, it was very compressed, very virulent. But then it plateaued back and there was a, a re-reversal of flows. Um, and that is in part, of course, due, and I analyzed this in the background paper in the valuation on COVID-19 and, and the capital flow, uh, 
dynamics with uh, the intervention of major central banks that really pumped up liquidity outside. I mean, the Fed had a uh, massive, unprecedented intervention, the ECB and others, and there were huge fiscal stimuli all over, and they, they continue to date. Um, but of course, as the GFSR of January um, examines, you know, emerging markets remain very exposed, quite vulnerable, and a large external financing need. So I just want to throw a question there. Uh, we didn't see much use of CFMs during, you know, 2020. And I wonder whether this, you know, huge amount of liquidity, which is going to, you know, like every tsunami is going to create this kind of uh, 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 flow in and out of liquidity. Do see, do expect a greater use of CFM, even greater than history in the future in relation to this uh, unprecedented pumping of liquidity? Or you think, we're really now in a, in a world where uh, these uh, measures are used very parsimoniously and other things will come at play to deal with the volatility. Anybody? Anton, uh, Jonathan, Anton, start. Um, okay, uh, so I think, um, yeah, we, we have been in this gigantic risk on rally since uh, essentially April last year. And uh, basically money has flown into all kinds of risky assets. And I guess from the perspective of governments the world over, uh, that has enabled them to pass precisely the kinds of stimulus measures and relief measures that have been needed. Now, um, capital uh, controls are used mostly for private sector flows because governments that need to, to access markets, they won't tax and control themselves. And that means uh, I think there has kind of structurally not really been that much of a role uh, for capital uh, flow measures uh, during the most recent post COVID surge of capital flows. Uh, that doesn't mean that it can't uh, lead to a bad end as you are suggesting Nicoletta. So let's all cross our fingers, but as you're saying, uh, big upswings oftentimes lead to the reversals. Jonathan, you. you... Uh, yeah, I, I agree with Anton. I mean, I, I guess I was modestly surprised at the, uh, the non-use of these measures. Um, I think it was important, at least in Asia, um, we we said clearly that these measures might be necessary. I think that's an important thing to say. Um, um, if if uh, if countries um, lack fiscal space and and um, uh, need to uh, provide vital support for their for their citizens um, that requires fiscal resources, they might there might be a need. Um, uh, for these heterodox uh, uh, measures, um, and you know, uh, you know, there is still a lot of money uh, that could flow out of emerging market countries. So it it uh, it could yet it could yet happen. Uh, Anton also said that money there we are in a classic risk on episode right now, um, uh, uh, and you know we we just have to see how this. Uh, how this plays out. Maybe this time for one last question from Ian. Ian from uh, Mauritius, you, you said you have several questions. I can give you space for one because we need to wrap up if you're still there. Ian Neild. No, it's okay. I, I can't think coherently. It's too late at night. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Nick. <Nicoletta. laughs> okay. That's well, I have a question from Andy Filardo if he's still there. Andy Filardo. Andy. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I wrote it in the chat box. I was just wondering about the transition. Um, I'm very sympathetic to the work of the IPF and uh, the refresh of the IV, but we're moving towards a world which has uh, much more discretion in terms of short term schedule policies. And ultimately, we want to move to a, a longer term scenario. Uh, where we have rules-based regimes, monetary policy and fiscal policy following rules, less discretion, more market-based uh, financial systems and fully liberalized capital flows. So I, I don't know how we get from more discretion now 
to a lot less discretion in the future. Uh, and are we talking about decades in terms of a grand strategy of a decade to get to this uh, ideal world? Or are we talking many, many decades? Anybody want to get this one? Um, let me let me add my two cents. So, so Andy, I think that is a very interesting question, and um, there are some significant benefits to more rules, but at the same time, they also curtail uh, the space for basically letting countries choose uh, what their political preferences are, and. Uh, for example, when policymakers change, political preferences may change. And I think we need to recognize that we can't impose a one size fit all rule on everybody. So uh, while I think um, we do want to create the kinds of frameworks that essentially forestall uh, the bad abuses of discretion, uh, let's say, uh, for example, the classic dilemma of discretionary monetary policy. We also want to make sure that countries do have enough space for discretion to implement their policy objectives uh, whenever they arise. So let's say um, maybe 15 years ago, very few people would have anticipated that we will face the problems of housing affordability that have characterized most of the past decade. And if we had excessively rigid rules about that, we could not respond in the way that our political processes require. So I think there is always going to be a lot of need for discretion in conjunction with rules to avoid abuses. Thank you, Anton. Um, Andrea, you want to If uh, we are done with the questions, I would like to take the opportunity to thank you all for being with us until the end. And, uh, I wish you a great rest of the day. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone.